I want to tell you a story. A story about a 20-year-old guy. He's healthy, no past medical history, no medications, no alcohol, no drugs. He's clean. But he's been acting strange. He's been acting strange for the past week that it is totally freaking out his parents. And his parents bring him in to see me in the emergency department because he's having this, these twitches, seizures, and they're really worried about him. I do what I always do. I start by taking a history. And it uh, doesn't really go anywhere. A lot of yeses, a lot of noes, a lot of duh. So no history. But I know something's not right because I've been around and I know that this kid was totally fine before and I'm very nervous about him and so are his parents. So I take the next step. I examine him. There's no focality. So then I order a confusogram. <laughs> Every single blood test I can think about, tox screens, quantitative, qualitative, urine tests, I scan his head and it's all normal. But again, I told you I'm conscientious. And I told you I'm thorough, and there's just something not right. So I'm going to go one step further. I'm going to bite the bullet. And I'm going to do a lumbar puncture. I give him some ceftriaxone, some vancomycin, some acyclovir, and I do that lumbar puncture. I'm feeling pretty good, because I'm just wondering if all my colleagues would have done the same thing. Like the best lumbar puncture ever. <laughs> Literally three minutes. The nurses think I had asked him for some help, and he's wondering if he's, I still need help. I'm like, I'm done. Got the samples, and it was flawless. <laughs> Champagne. Zero red cells. Seven white cells. And I send it for everything under the sun. CMV, West Nile, crypto, and of course, HSV. Because that's the money shot. This is a guy who's acting strange, even though he has normal vitals. And uh, I wipe myself clean of this guy. I refer him to internal medicine, hard admitting service. I've done my job, and I, I think I've done it really well. I'm pretty thorough. I'm feeling pretty good. But. I want you to stop. I want you to stop and think about some young person who was really screwed up and you had no idea. And now it is time to change the world. So the next day, or actually not the next day, I think I had some time off, a week or 10 days later, I pulled up his medical record number, which is my way of staying on top of patients so I can learn from my successes. <laughs> or mistakes. And I look and I start reading this note, and of course my uh, lumbar puncture, all those crazy viruses I sent, grew nothing. But then as I read this note, uh, my eyes were glued to the page. My first thing I saw was lorazepam, phenytoin, and plastic. And I was like, what the hell's going on here? You remember that patient you saw? So I keep reading. He gets intubated. He has an MRI, an EEG, nothing. On day three, he's extubated. And uh, he's kind of acting really strange. And he sees a neurologist who says, this ain't neurological. Let's get one of the psychiatrists involved who the psychiatrist comes and says, this ain't psychiatric, it's time to think elsewhere. And on day 10, a fresh face, a fresh opinion, a neurologist comes in and says, I think I know what he has. And she was right. I want to start him on IV, IG, and steroids. As I'm reading this note of this mystery novel that's unfolding, I say, okay, fine. We give steroids to everyone. What's the difference? I mean, I'm sure that I would have thought of that too. <laughs> Hi, VIG. What is she going with? 
And she queried and was right that this young man had something called anti-NMDA receptor encephalitis. Now, that's a mouthful, and I have no clue what that even stands for. <laughs> I know it's not that fun party drug, like for those afterworld folks, but I want to tell you about this. The mean age is 21. It is four times more common in females, and only 5% of the population who get this disease are over the age of 45. This is a young person's problem. It's only about 12 years old or something like that, and originally when it was first described, it was based on a case series of five or six cases that linked this disorder to those disgusting ectodermal tumors in the ovaries, those ovarian teratomas that contain hair and teeth and eyeballs and made for wonderful coffee table photos in your med school days. Originally, it was felt to be a perineoplastic encephalopathy, where these teratomas had neuronal tissue, and after some viral insult, the body would attack the tumor and recognize the neuronal tissues in your hippocampus and limbic system and attack those as well. What we know is that this is only the mechanism in 38% of the time is it perineoplastic. It's almost exclusively in women at 90 4%, and 97% of those, it's an ovarian teratoma, that's the cause. But it also has an autoimmune mechanism for that other 62%. If you're dozing off, wake up. This is key. If you look at people under the age of 30 years old, this is four times more common than HSV, VZV or West Nile virus. This is the most common encephalitis of the youth. We need to move this from the esoteric to an actual threat. This is real. How are we gonna do that? We first have to understand how these people present. There are four unique stages. The first stage is a prodrome that 60 to 80 people get, percent of people get. Fevers, coughs, colds, by no means am I advocating anyone should be hearing the hoofbeats when that goes down. The second phase that occurs two to 14 days later is a psychotic phase. 77% will have delusions, hallucinations, 75% will have seizures, and the key is this is someone who was completely normal before. There was no prodrome, but they are profoundly more schizophrenic-like as opposed to other encephalopathies. They will fool you, but they will n were normal before. And you can understand with a mean age of 21 and a first presentation psychosis, someone's gonna be put down the wrong path. The third phase is an unresponsive phase, which has catatonia, and 85% of people have lip smacking and automatisms. And finally comes a fourth phase, which is a hyperkinetic phase, which has autonomic instability and circulatory collapse. What's puzzling here is this is not an easy diagnosis to make by conventional means. Your blood work won't help you, your CT won't help you, your MRI probably won't help you. Your ER, EEG won't help you. Your serum probably won't help you. You will need to do a lumbar puncture. And you will need to do a lumbar puncture and send it for antibodies against the anti-NMDA receptor. Now, I want to tell you something that's not yet out in the world. A group of doctors from my hospital and some collaborators in Washington are putting together a case series of 100 patients. This will be published in the next month or two. What they found is with 100 confirmed cases of anti-NMDA on LP serum, on LP CSF, 75% of those had a bland tap. Nada. No whites, no prots, no glucose, nothing. So when you get that LP that has nothing on it, that does not mean you don't have a brain problem. 
you will need to wait or approach this to get those CSF studies. DeBakey says that no physician can diagnose a condition she never thinks about. Thinking about anti-NMDA is a game changer. 25% of people do terribly. 7% die. 18% have profound permanent neurological abnormalities. And up to 15 to 25% of these patients will relapse, especially those who are not perineoplastic. What we need to do is treat these people. Steroids plus either IVIG or Plex are your first line agents. Your second line agents are things like rituximab or cyclophosphamide. And you need to treat these people when you have a pretest because you can't wait for three, seven, or 10 days to get that CSF back. You need to do an age-related malignancy screen, focusing on the genital areas, your pelvis, your testes, and your ovaries, but really making sure you cover your chest, your abdo pelvis. People who have a perineoplastic cause do better once the tumor is removed. Some of you have maybe heard the story of Susanna Cahalan a young woman in her 20s who was a New York Post reporter who had a movie and a book she wrote called Brain on Fire. It was about her month of madness when she was bounced around from psychiatrist to neurologist to doctor without anyone figuring out how she had gone psychotic with no prodrome. But her parents did the most important thing. They advocated for her. They judged her. They knew that this was not her. And finally, with much pushing in this New York hospital, she was pushed into seeing a neurology floor on an epilepsy unit as opposed to a psychiatric unit. This is scary. By no means am I asking or telling you to do clock drawing. I haven't done one of these in 20 years. But that's Susanna's clock. The neurologist who performed a really exhaustive physical exam, more than just a CT scan type thing, he looked at this and he said, all the numbers are on the right side. The right side of her brain's not working. This is not psychiatric. This is a neurological problem. Her brain is on fire. Maybe there is a role for clock drawing. How did our patient do? At six months, he was fully functional independent for his ADLs and IADLs, would have been quicker if he got his IVIG and steroids sooner than 10 days? I'm not sure, but I know that there's substantial improvement in neurological outcome the sooner you give the drugs. I want to leave you with three important conclusions. I never give a talk without talking about plus one. I am a simple person and I need to take patterns. With here, it is first presentation psychosis plus fever. First presentation psychosis plus seizure. First presentation psychosis plus movement disorder. And lastly, first presentation psychosis with intolerance to antipsychotics. That last one's super important. Up to 47% of people with anti-NMDA will get a neuroleptic malignant-like syndrome when treated with drugs like Haldol. This is going to be your clinical clue, and it is so much more common to have it with anti-NMDA than it is just when you have a psychiatric condition. It should be a very big red flag in a young person with an NMS-like picture. The second pearl is you need to plant the seed. There is a team of people, and you might not be the quarterback of this person's inpatient care, but you need to let them know what you're thinking about, your neurologist, your intensivist, your internal medicine, your hospice people. You need to let them know where you're at. And lastly, you need to treat on spec. 
when that gram stain's negative, when their culture's negative, when you know that this pretest is high, we give steroids for everything. And hey, I've never seen rabies, but I've given a ton of rig. I've never seen tetanus, but I've given a ton of TIG. I've seen a couple cases of this. It's time for IVIG. It's time to think now about changing the way you used to practice. Way too much acyclovir in this population. Have we turned a zebra into a horse? It is estimated that 90% of patients with anti-NMDA are undiagnosed. This is not a rare disorder. It is rarely diagnosed. It is time for you to change the world. I've missed one of these. Have you? Thank you so much for your time.